Welcome. We want to welcome you around the world. We welcome you in Europe. I know it's morning there. We welcome you in Africa. We welcome you in Asia, South Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, Central Asia. We welcome you all over the world to this special event. I'm right now in Kona, Hawaii. It's a beautiful time right here, a beautiful group of people at the Ohana Court at the University of the Nations Kailua Kona, Hawaii. We also, right now, we're going to be hearing from Brother Andrew, who is in Holland right now. And right now in Los Angeles is Joy Dawson. And so we're going to hear th them as well. But right now we want to welcome you and say, tell your friends, don't listen and lo look alone. Watch with someone else. Call them right now, text them right now, tweet them right now, tell them to get online right here to IOM.live. Uh, and we want to have a big congregation around the world celebrating Jesus as Aaron Barker and his band lead us out now in worship. Go to the throne of God through worship, lifting up Jesus all over the world at this occasion. Hey man, why don't we stand together? This last week as the body of Christ, we celebrated Resurrection Sunday. And so tonight or today, wherever we are, let's celebrate the power of the resurrection and celebrate Jesus' victory tonight.
Jesus.
Take us deeper. We want to know you in all of your glory, Lord Jesus.
lift our voices all across the nations of the earth. Let's begin to cry out as one YWAM family, asking the Lord to touch the nations that we represent. Begin to lift your voice wherever you are. Begin to cry out for your home nation. Begin to cry out for the nation that God's put on your heart, that we would see the knowledge of the glory of the Lord cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Jesus, the whole nations belong to you. Jesus at the center. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, He will always be. It's always been you, Jesus. Jesus at the center of it all Jesus at the center of it all From beginning to the end It will always be It's always been you, Jesus Jesus, nothing else
Take a moment and lift up the name of Jesus.
from you. Just go to Facebook chat and either send us a e uh, text or an emoji or whatever you want. <laughs> we want to hear from you. We'd also like to take a role of the nations. Wherever you are in the world, what is your nationality? And where are you in the world? We'd like to hear from you, but my name is Lauren Cunningham, and I get to host this event. And it's going to be the first of many events we're going to have. But this one is very really special for me, because as we uh, meet together around the world, we're going to have some of those that have gone before us that are known, literally have been ministered to by millions and millions of people. And one is almost 90, the other's 92. I'm just the young guy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm only 81. But as we come together at this time, already we've heard from Samoa, Thailand, Canada, Korea, Mexico, Nicaragua, Australia, and the UK, also South Africa, and Sweden, and New Zealand. We want to hear from you wherever you are. We're going to keep this alive, and you go to ywam.live. And wherever you are, tell your friends about it because we're going to keep this on for several days so that no one will have to miss out because we're going to hear some amazing teaching tonight by especially two that are so outstanding, and then I'm going to wrap it up at the end. But as we do so, we want to glorify Jesus most of all. And one of those that I have seen that has glorified Jesus is someone I met 50 years ago. It was in the month of January, exactly 50 years ago. And it, she was a housewife. But for 14 years, she had been told that she was going to go to the nations of the earth. And here where she was, time was ticking by, and I was... In the basement, they had a prophet's uh, room down there. And I was in a one-week fast. And during that week, the Lord said, I want you to go up and invite this lady, this housewife, to the nations. And uh, so I went up and I said, have you been called to teach to the nations? She said, yes. And she showed me her 14 notebooks where she had been preparing for the time that God would release her to the nations. Now, I spent time in prayer with her and her husband, Jim. Her son was only 12 years old. That was John Dawson. Jill Dawson, she was younger. And we had wonderful family times. I had a wonderful family time with them. And I got to know them by the Spirit of God. And intercession was a way of life for that family. And more than that, this woman, Joy Dawson, she was one that knew how to press into the Word of God and live it out and lead in the place of intercessory prayer. And she began to pray for me and then for YWAM, praying every day for all of these 50 years. Now, this is a woman that has literally, she has influ influenced multitudes, millions of people, and especially leaders that are well-known. You would know the names of them, but it's a scores of leaders that she has, has influenced in a very special way. She has a prophetic ministry, intercessory ministry, teaching ministry, and this is a woman of God. And I want you to hear her as she speaks from Los Angeles, California. Let's welcome Joy Dawson all the way around the world. 
from Los Angeles, Joy. Thank you, Lauren, for those gracious remarks. I so appreciate what you said. The message that God has laid upon my heart to give to you tonight is really a whole lot of questions. And the heading is, how much is eternity on your mind? In God's Word, the Bible, we read in Ecclesiastes 3.11, God has put eternity in man's, that means and woman's, mind. So, what are we doing with and how are we processing these thoughts that God has put there about life after death? Are we focused on living for eternity or just for this little short time here on earth? That's where most people are focused. Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 says, Set your mind on things above not on things on the earth. Now, if we are committed believers to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, we need to answer the next question. Are we aware that how we live here on earth determines how we will live in eternity? The Apostle Paul understood that. And he asks these questions in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Don't you know that God's people will judge the world, meaning in eternity? And again in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 6, he asks another very pertinent question. Don't you know that the Christians are going to judge angels in eternity? Not all believers among God's people will qualify for these assignments. Let's think about the implications now. If we haven't taken the time to find out and record the names of every nation in the world and pray for them strategically according to God's ways from the Bible, how could we qualify to be a judge over them. We couldn't. So you might ask me a question. You might say, well, where does God tell us to pray for all the nations? I haven't heard that before. I'll tell you. The reason for all personal blessings, according to Psalm 67, 1 to 2, is that all nations are to be blessed by every blessing that God gives us. Listen to these words. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that his way may be known upon earth, his saving power among all nations, clear as daylight. Very seldom, very seldom ever taught. And then Jesus' prayer mandate is found in Mark 11, verse 17. My house, Jesus said, will be a house of prayer for all nations. Again, Isaiah 56, verse 7 says, My house, meaning God's house, shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Is your church God's house? Is your home God's house? Then is your church and your home a place where all the nations of the world are being prayed for? It can be. That's what my home is all about and has been all our married life, or most of it. I once went into a church where I was participating in the service, and it's in um, Seattle, Washington, and 
this pastor took this very, very seriously. And before he told me, and I saw it happen, before every service, it doesn't matter what the nature of it is, in his church, a nation of the world is prayed for, and he, like I, has a, has a systematic um, written account of every nation and every nation is being prayed for in that church. It's the only church I know. I'm not saying it's the only church, but it's the only church I know, and I've traveled the world and been to goodness knows how many churches. If your house is God's house, then all the nations should be being prayed for in it and as with your church. At the end of my book, right at the very end, entitled Intercession, Thrilling and Fulfilling, I have a, an, a, uh, every single nation named there and in alphabetical order. And you can get, so you can get the copy of the nations from the back of that book. Next question. What have we done to obey Jesus' command, not a suggestion, in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, which says, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me, said Jesus. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you and I am with you always to the close of the age. Did you notice the word go? Go, therefore, and make disciples. Go means a change of location. I believe we need a story of divine guidance to not go, He's told us to go. We need a story of divine guidance to stay at home in the light of that mandate. If our honest response is that we've done little or not enough or maybe nothing about going and witnessing and discipling people in nations, then how do we think we would qualify to rule over nations in eternity? We won't. We don't. Jesus' mandate, by the way, go, means a lot more than going on a short-term field trip with some church folks. That's good, but it doesn't qualify to Jesus' command. Pause for thought, please. Now, there's another important question coming up. It relates back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 3 about Christians judging angels in eternity. Have you ever thought about that? Have we been cooperating with and been grateful for the ministry of the angels assigned to us? We should be. Each person has two of them, the Bible tells us. I am extremely grateful for angels. I believe that it's more than likely that I wouldn't be here speaking to you today unless angels had shown up in a time of desperate need for me. I'm going to tell you about it. When I lived in New Zealand, and I haven't lived there for about 46 years, and it was during the, the earlier part of my life when I lived there, I had been visiting a Christian friend whose house was halfway down a road that, were, that was on a very, very steep slope, about like that. When it came time for me to leave her home, I foolishly and carelessly backed out of her driveway onto the steep road, driveway, onto the road 
without stopping to look for any oncoming traffic. Terrible. The next thing I knew, it, this was all in seconds. The next thing I knew, look, I was looking up and seeing a car going at a very high speed and heading straight for my car, which was out in the road. There was no time for that car to stop or even swerve. A crash was absolutely inevitable. Both of us had broken the, the, the rules. Mysteriously and without any logical explanation, that car, instead of crashing right into me, sped past me without any contact at all, but with only a coat of paint between us. Immediately, I knew that somehow angelic intervention was absolutely the only explanation. Stunned and convicted by the Holy Spirit of being so irresponsible, I thanked God for his great mercy and his protection. If I'm going to judge angels, I'll be as lenient <laughs> on them as possible. I'll just give them non-stop my deep appreciation for their wonderful ministry. Now let's think a little bit more about this angel thing. We have a responsibility to be asking God frequently as Christians to send angels to minister to the great and varied needs of the vast numbers of persecuted Christians and the millions of refugees worldwide. I have messages related to both those categories of enormous need and they can be available from my website. Let's look now at just seven ways that angels can minister to us and others when we're in need so that we will see how we can pray um, these prayers for those in, in desperate need. Now, the, I'm only going to give you seven for time's sake, but there are a lot, lot more than these. But here, here we go on seven ways that we can pray. We can pray in faith for God to send angels to protect and defend, according to Psalm 91, verse 11. Then we can pray that, they, that angels will come to strengthen people in a time of great trial, mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, as the angels did with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross. Luke 22, verse 43 says, And there appeared an angel from heaven, strengthening Jesus. And that same angel or angels can visit us and others. I pray often, very, very often for these seven ways and more for the desperately needy refugees and, and uh, the persecuted church. Three, they can cook a meal in the most impossible circumstances, as they did with Elijah. 1 Kings 19, verses 5 through 6, an angel baked a cake on hot stones and gave him a jar of water when he was alone, exhausted, and wanted to die. Four, they can fight against evil principalities on our behalf or others when we are interceding for a nation or nations or needy people groups. Daniel chapter 9, Verses 21 to 22, Daniel said, While I was speaking in prayer, Gabriel came to me in swift flight and said to me, I have now come to give you wisdom and understanding. Daniel chapter 10, verse 3. Michael, another archangel, joined forces with Gabriel to resist and defeat Satan's power and plans to stop Daniel's prayer being answered. What fabulous experiences that would be for Daniel to have 
two archangels coming to him when he was interceding for his nation. Fifthly, they can, they can miraculously deliver from prisons. Acts chapter 12, verse 7 says, An angel of the Lord appeared um, as with Peter, as he did with, uh, he can do it as with Peter. And it says, And a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter on the side and woke him up, and the chains fell off his hands. And my paraphrased version is, said, let's get out of here, man. Okay, the angels can do all this for those who are trapped and believe there is no hope if we will believe God. Then, sixthly, angels can give us directions for the next unexpected ministry assignment. You say, where on earth was that? Acts chapter 8, verse 38. An angel uh, came and told Philip to leave a successful evangelistic outreach among the Samaritans and go toward Gaza by the desert, desert road for a specific ministry assignment with an important man. Don't read the Bible and think, oh, that's just in Bible days. Everything that is in the Bible can be done again. Seven, an angel showed up to Paul in the middle of a horrendous storm at sea at night and gave him a strong word of encouragement that no lives would be lost. Acts chapter 27, verses 23 to 24, and no lives were lost. So let's get with the angel business. <coughs> Next question, what are our spiritual ambitions for our lives after death? You might say, I've never even given it a thought. Well, you're supposed to. That's why we've got this message. Can we name them, the spiritual ambitions we've got in eternity? And can we explain them from a biblical basis? We should be able to. If 100% of our answers are negative, we'd say, no, I haven't got a clue. I don't, I don't know what all that's about. We need to make some serious adjustments as a way of life. If our sole ambition here on earth has been to live for God's glory, it will be the same passionate desire for our lives throughout eternity regardless of what God ass assigns for us to do. Psalm 105 verse 1 says, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. It will be the same passionate desire for our lives throughout eternity if that's been our passionate de desire down here. That's regardless of what God assigns for us to do. And he has assigned many very strange and in the natural very difficult things for me to do. But they haven't been difficult because I live to obey Jesus instantly, fully, instantly, joyfully, and fully. And if I look an idiot before audiences, which I'm sure I must have many times, that doesn't bother me. It's not an audience that I'm going to answer for at the judgment seat. It's Jesus. And I live with eternity's priorities in view all the time. Psalm 105 verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. And Jesus can only get glory to the degree we are obeying him instantly, joyfully, and fully. Not to us give, 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 give glory for this, because of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. You deserve to get it all, 100%, all of the time. 
regardless of the cost to us. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in us to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, I have meditated an awful lot on this one verse. And this is what I've come up with. If God is the one who is motivating us to obey what he tells us to do, and then once he's motivated us, he then empowers us to do the thing he's motivated us to do. Who's the, who's the explanation when it comes forth powerfully through us? There's only one logical explanation. It's God. It's therefore totally illogical and to me obnoxious if we're not giving him 100% of the glory 100% of the time. Another question. How often do we think about the first time we'll look into Jesus' eyes? Have you ever, ever thought about that? I've thought about it a lot. Those eyes, I can tell you now, burn with the fire of his white hot holiness and his unfathomable, unending, liquid love. We will be shocked. I'm sorry. Will we be shocked when we look into his eyes the first time? Will we be embarrassed? Will we be totally surprised and full of regret because we hadn't taken the time to study every one of his characteristics and the principles by which he operates from his word, the Bible? Now, that's a very time-consuming but deeply rewarding project. I know from personal experience I've done it. If we've been making God's priorities, our priorities, and as I said a moment ago, been obeying him instantly, fully, and joyfully as a way of life, when we see him, we will say, Oh! You rewarded me on earth with much revelation of what you really like, but oh, you're so much more. I just want to worship you. So we will want to fall down at his nails, God feet and kiss them and thank him through our tears for the unbelievably high price he paid at Calvary's cross for our total redemption. Just as we did many times on earth. My favorite place with Jesus is down at his feet, kissing where I think the, the hole would have gone through to make it nail sky. Kissing those feet and thanking him and loving him. In a soon coming day in eternity, each one of us, Christian or non-Christian, is going to have to stand before the righteous judge of all the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. We read about that in John 5, 22. That's a statement of truth. None of us can escape judgment day. And listen to his assessment on what we did with the opportunities we had on earth to know him and to make him known. I'm going to repeat that. We are going to stand in eternity, every one of us, Christian or non-Christian, and have to stand before the righteous judge of all the earth, Jesus Christ. And listen to what we did with the opportunities we had on earth to know him and to make him known. I repeated it because it's so, so important. The disciples of the Lord Jesus will, be, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14 tells us that. All else will stand before the great white throne. Revelation 20 verse 11 tells us that. 
In Ecclesiastes 3 verse 17, we read, God will bring to judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity and a time for every deed. That means there will be a time where everything that we have done that has been recorded in books, it tells us. Who would have been doing the recording of what you did this morning and what I did last night and what both of us have done every single hour of our life is recorded in the books. Angels will have done the recording. It's just one of their ministries. That is the most awesome thought to me. I live accordingly. Oh, I think so much about this and consequently it affects my decisions, all my decisions and all my actions because an angel is there recording what I'm doing. Nothing is covered up. Luke Luke 12, 2 says, Nothing is hidden that shall not be made known. Do you think we need to live, to live more in the light of eternity? Let me give you an example of how seriously I take living for eternity. Every single time without exception, I am preparing a message from God's word that I have to teach, whether to large audiences or small I do it as though I were just about to face Jesus at the judgment seat. That's how seriously I take it. I happened to share this one time with a vital male missionary friend of mine who was just about to speak a message in a church. We were walking into the church together with my husband Jim at that time. He went to be with Jesus four years ago. But at that time he was alive and we were just walking into the church with this missionary friend and I, I made that statement of how seriously I take preparing a message. He, this man, a dear friend, was known to have a, a low-key way of presenting his messages. It, it was just part of his low-key personality. To my absolute amazement, that testimony which I had just given him made such an impact on him spiritually, God somehow used it to change his whole way of presenting his message. <laughs> it became... To my amazement, he, he was vibrant, alive, animated, and the whole message was so much more impacting than I'd ever heard him when he spoke before. I watched it happen in front of me. Praise the Lord. But eternity's perspective obviously made the difference. Eternity's perspective will make all the difference all the time to everything we do. Luke 12, 48 is a very sobering verse to me. Everyone to whom much is given, from him much more will be required. That means the more privileges we've had over our lifetime to know about eternal truths, the more accountable we'll be. My privileges have been from birth right to this moment in time now, non-stop. I am therefore extremely accountable to God and will be judged accordingly. That's justice. Another question. What are the chances of the Lord Jesus saying, to us in eternity, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. 
Or is he likely to say, I had plans and purposes to use you so much more for my glory, but you chose to prioritize your time on earth on transient earthly things. Or is he likely to say, you chose to make decisions on how to fulfill your ministry assignments without waiting on me first for directions. And believing that in my unswerving faithfulness, I would never let you down, no matter what I would prompt you to do. Or you lack the willingness to pay the price or have the spiritual ambition to fulfill your destiny regardless of the cost. You were not will, fully willing to take up your cross and follow me. Think about those alternatives. Ponder them, and may God use them to change your life in relation to how you view eternity. One of the main reasons why we're unprepared for eternity is because the triune God comprising the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is often not fully known for who he really is. He so understood and so underrated. Now, let's look at his character first. His character is always predict predictable always holy, always just, always kind, always faithful. But Jeremiah 9, 23, 24 gives us the very best def definition of God's character that I know. And because I've been studying his character and his ways over a life, most of my life, I was excited when I found many years ago Jeremiah 9, 23, 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories, glories in this, that he understands and knows me. And then here comes the best definition of God in the Bible, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, first. Justice and judgment, second. Third, holiness and righteousness. Love, justice, holiness. All the other attributes of God flow out of those three. And that's the perfect balance of who God is at all times. It is very important to make a thorough study of that one in the middle, the justice of God from God's word. Why? Inevitably, things will happen in our lives that are totally beyond our understanding. And only, I said only, having strong revelation of God's justice will enable us to maintain genuine worship to God and total trust. I know I've had my share of things totally beyond my understanding and still have that in my life right now. But it's no problem to me to be loving Jesus, praising and worshiping him, throwing him kisses, just adoring him, and trusting him completely, even though I don't have a shred of understanding of why some things are happening in my life right now and have happened. Now, when Job was being severely, severely tested by God, and the Bible tells us he was the most righteous man in all the earth. What a commercial <laughs> for a man when you know who said it. But he didn't pass his tests. He did not. I was just reading, I think it was yesterday or the day before, in my normal reading of the scriptures, in Job chapter 10. All through Job chapter 10, 
verse after verse after verse, and it's not a short chapter, I found God, uh, Job, I'm sorry, Job, repeatingly speaking to God and telling him how unjust he was, unfair. This is not right. This should never be happening to me. And then one little tiny verse, it was verse 12, tucked in the middle of all this, these verses of accu- accusing God for being unjust and unloving and unfair. There's this tiny little verse here. It says, You have granted me life and steadfast love and your care has preserved my spirit. And I thought, how odd. He's, he's telling God he's blessed him mightily. And I thought, why would that be? This is what I came up with, or the Holy Spirit showed me. That any time any human being is angry and mad with God and accusing him of being less than who he is, which is perfect, they must have a conscience inside knowing that, this is, that what they're doing is wrong. And Job's conscience was pricking him right there, right in the middle of it. But even after he said that, he still went on accusing God. I am convinced, um, at least let's give, that was, we're talking about God's character. Now look at God's ways. God's ways are how he demonstrates and works with his character with his perfect character and his ways are perfect but they're not always understandable and Romans 11.33 says how unsearchable we can't find out and, and plumb at the depth of and fathom are his judgments the way he operates and his ways they are past finding out so you can't put God in a box and predict he's going to, he, his, his character is predictable, but the way he operates can be unpredictable. And we can't understand that. That's why it's so terribly important to really make a study of his justice. Now, I am convinced that until we can fully worship God as a God of mystery, and find that absolutely intriguing <laughs> that we can't work him out. We can't fully appreciate him. This is my abbreviated version of him. He's the most understanding, loving, faithful, just, fascinating, awe inspiring mind-boggling, mysterious, otherworldly, indescribably beautiful, utterly awesome, totally holy, timeless, uncreated being in the universe who calls himself from the Bible, I am. Nobody else can say that. Because I am is totally, totally inclusive of everything. He's, he, I am everything you and I will ever need from here right through on out eternity. The great I am. I adore him. Mm. Jesus, Jesus, you're too much. Now that's just my abbreviation. That's just my abbreviated version. My full version of of my description of Jesus is found in my book, Intimate Friendship with God. And I I have a whole page of, of adjectives about him. Now, maybe you've never realized that what you do about the Lord Jesus' invitation to come and live within your heart found in Revelation 3.20 has everything to do with where you will spend eternity. Jesus says, 
I, this is in um, Revelation 3.20, Jesus said, I, Jesus, am standing at the door of your heart, knocking. If anyone listens to my voice and opens the door, I will come in and be his guest. Now the handle of our heart's door is on the inside. There's no handle on the outside. Jesus will never force his way into our lives. He wants a relationship with us, not an adherence to a religion, not a re not he doesn't want to be a dictator. He wants to be a friend. He's the lover of my soul. He wants to be that to you. He wants to forgive us from all our sins. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Our sins have separated us from a holy God. But that's why Jesus, God's Son, who was sinless, took the punishment for all our sins on the cross of Calvary that we might believe in him as our savior and substitute and be given eternal life. That's to live with him throughout eternity. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What an incredible deal. <laughs> there isn't a greater one. Our part is to acknowledge and repent of our sins and ask for Jesus' forgiveness, to thank him for dying for those sins and ask him to come in and live within our hearts as we open the door and receive him as our Savior and make him our Lord. John 3.36 is not nearly as quoted as John 3, as John 3.16, but I believe it's an extremely important verse. Seldom quoted. He who believes in the Son of God has everlasting life, and that word believe means total trust and, and um, surrendering of the will. It's not just a head, head knowledge. He who believes in the Son of God has everlasting life. And he who does not believe shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. I'm going to repeat it. He who believes in the Son of God has everlasting life. And he who does not believe, does not trust in him for, for salvation, shall not see eternal life but the wrath of God abides on him. Hell was never meant for mankind, but only for Satan and a third of the angels who rebelled against God at that time and were cast down onto the earth, out of heaven. Hell, hear me, is as real as heaven. Where we will all spend eternity is entirely our choice. Choose surrender to Jesus. Do yourself a favor. Choose life and eternity with him. If you're prepared to do that now, I'm going to lead you in a prayer which you can sincerely repeat after me and I'm going to pray it very slowly so that you can hear clearly, understand it, and then choose to repeat the prayer and have eternal life. Are you ready to pray? Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I turn away from my sin in repentance. And I ask you to forgive me.
I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. And I thank you with all my heart. I now invite you to come into my heart and life. By faith, I receive you as my Savior. and make you my Lord and Master. Thank you for cleansing me from my sins with your precious shed blood. And forgiving me and giving me eternal life. If you have sincerely prayed that prayer, you have become a born-again believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have eternal life. You're his child, and you have eternity secure in the right place, heaven. In closing... The last verse I'm going to give you is from Romans 10 and 9. If we, you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And verse 11 says, For man believes with his heart and so is justified and confesses with his lips and so is, so is saved. We need, you need, as soon as possible to tell somebody what you've just done and how you've received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Every one of us, I'm going to close in prayer now. Father, I pray that every one of us will live with much more focus, will live much more focused on eternity's values and its consequences and for the extension of your kingdom and our fulfillment for Jesus' glory alone. I trust you to do that with the truths that have been spoken from your word by your spirit in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. standing in awe of the character and the nature of God. His joy has just ministered so beautifully to us. Let's sing this song together. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty Early in the
lift our voices to the Lord and exalt Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Thank you, it's really awesome. Thank you, Eric, for leading us in that beautiful song. And I want you to ponder what God has said to us through this mighty woman of God, a teacher of the Word of God, a prophetic voice into the nations. And as you ponder it, think about that church she is talking about. I know that church. They put plaques all around the, the auditorium, naming every single nation. Here in Kona, we have what we call the Plaza of Nations. And I went to every country in the world, so I picked up rocks. Now, some of them got thrown away, but uh, otherwise, I put them out there. But I put a little plaque out there around a fountain that is threefold, symbolizing the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And three beautiful uh, sculptures done by one of our own uh, staff here, Ruth Anderson. And one is coming to receive, the other is to glorify the Lord, and the other is to go out to give to the nations. And the flags around there are for the purpose of people realizing we're called to the nation, but we come from the nations. It's from everywhere to everywhere. And so as we put the names of every country, it's so you can go around and pray for every country in the world. And I, I would urge you around the world to hear this word. Think about the eternity. Think about the God of eternity, his character, his ways. Did you hear it? And what I've, I've never heard this message, but like she told me on the phone recently, just uh, the last few days as we're talking about this evening. And... She, at that time, says, now I'm going to give a brand new message. God's just give me a new message. That's what you've heard. That's what you've heard. And you've heard something of history. But you've heard something that is historic for the future. Your future. Your eternity. And as she was talking about the angels, I couldn't help but think about a story I just heard that came from 1970, a team driving. In fact, uh, Jim and Jan Rogers are here right now in Kona, and uh, they were leading that team to Afghanistan, the first time to go into Afghanistan. We've been there every year since then till today. And as they were driving all night, they would trade off, and they'd have one sit beside the driver to keep them awake, and, and Doug Sparks was sitting by the driver and he went to sleep Doug did and finally he woke up at this time they were actually traveling through the mountains going uh, in the eastern part of Iran and treacherous drops cliffs off to the right and no no safety rail at all and as they were going around it was little twisting circular type roads going around the mountain and he looked as he woke up and turned and looked at the driver Ken Coral he was sound asleep and as they were driving he didn't Doug didn't know whether to wake him up or not or startle him because he was turning like this somebody was turning that driving wheel God has protected YWAM all over the world we, didn't, we don't even notice it and I've always been you know loving driving actually I, I was licensed at age 13 California at that time had 60 days before you were 14 you could have your learner's permit and so I've been driving like that for years on every continent. Never had an accident when I was driving. I've had an accident on every continent, but not when I was driving. But, you know, I was uh, meeting with our leaders 
from not YWAM leaders, but the leaders in the body of Christ, uh, the father, fathers of the house church movement in China. And they were meeting here in Kona. We had a whole week and we were praying and believing and looking for God's ways, his strategies to actually release a million more missionaries out into the world. And since that day, uh, let's see, is this two years or a year ago? Uh, in that way, since, since that day, we now have someone training 50 of them in one part of the Middle East and 100 of them already training in another part. And they're also in other parts of the world. We're, we're training those missionaries out from China apart, the first part of a mighty move of God in missions. Wow. And I was so exhausted one afternoon. I thought, I got to get home and at least get a little nap. So I was driving right down Queen K Highway. And uh, this one guy was right on my bumper in back. And it, you know, that's where many accidents occur. I don't like that one. And, uh, and as I'm driving along, there's one part there. I fell asleep. I fell asleep. Oh, I don't do that. I just don't do that. But I did. And, and I, I was sound asleep, and suddenly my wheel turned with a jerk. I opened my eyes as I was just turning back into my lane. Cars were off the road all up and down the other side of the street. I was coming on head on at them. And the guy in back of me, he was way back there. He didn't want to be around when I was, yeah. Anyway, there's something about angels that we don't understand, but still we don't give them glory, but we're going to be grateful. And we're thanking God for all that he's doing. And now we're hearing from other parts of the world. We've now heard from every continent in the world except Antarctica. I don't know what's happening down there. But we want to hear from Antarctica. If you're online, come tell us. Go to the Facebook chat and tell us where, that you're, you're hearing in as well so that we can be at all seven locations. But here's, uh, here's another one. Lunavala, India. That's South Asia. Minsk, Belorussia. Norway. Yes. Here's one from Australia. Hobart, Tasmania. And uh, they, they send in this w word. Uh, Joy Dawson has been my hero since DTS 1981. Such an amazing teacher, inspiration from Hobart, Tasmania. And from John Ogden Coney heard, Joy, you are amazing. God used you to change my life 28 years ago in DTS Fiji. I'm now planting churches in Denmark. Isn't that something? And go, don't watch alone. Go to somebody, get texting and uh, tweet them or whatever, Instagram, whatever you're doing, and tell them, get online at uh, Youth with a Mission, ywam.live. That's ywam.live. And that's all they need to do to tune in. And we're going to keep this on and archive it as well so that translation can be done see it in ywam alone and we're going way beyond ywam with this but in ywam alone we're teaching every 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 day in 97 languages we just couldn't have 97 translators here tonight so what we're suggesting number one is that you get the archived edition of this uh, e this event and you can translate it by putting subtitles on it afterwards and then begin to play it and have people come into your home, into your church, into your base, your school, your government office, wherever it is, and become a part of this event over the next few days and weeks. The numbers will grow as we 
spread the word around the world. It's historic in this way as well, because into the future, we're going to be meeting like this by the millions around the world. And we're going to have devices that are now available, but they're, we're just not quite up to that yet. And that's, there's going to be instant translations. I was talking to a scientist of this from Bell Lab. And uh, you can literally have instantaneous translations into many. In fact, they eventually will have it in all languages after we get the Bible into all languages. And so as it goes into all languages of the world, it will have the sound of your voice. So I'm not saying that we're just going to do that from these three that you're hearing tonight, but you're, you're, we're just kicking it off, and that's why it's historic. We're going to have people like yourselves right now around the world getting online, getting a gathering going, and we're going to crisscross the globe all over the world through cyberspace. Isn't that a neat thing that God has invented for us, that we can literally communicate to the world the messages that God gives us from the Word of God. We can communicate in every way possible. So be a part of this. Now as we go into this next time, this is one of my dearest friends. Both of these are two of my dearest friends that I'm sharing with tonight. But we have done this in person on, I, I, can't, I can count five continents, maybe it's been six. And we've been doing this for years back in the 70s and 80s. But tonight, as I called them up and I said, I have this from the Lord that we're to, to renew something here for the next generations so that they'll catch not only our hearts and our vision, and, but that they will also see the way that they too can become a part in a global way of what cost us a lot of miles on a lot of planes over the years. And so I have over 6 million miles on planes. Can you imagine in a tin can with a fire in the tail throwing me across the world? Uh, it's not exactly a great thing to enjoy. But it gets you there. And Jesus said, go, so we go. And this one that I'm presenting now, one of my dearest friends, and we together, just the two of us, have ministered in many, many parts of the world, at least five continents with him for sure. And uh, as, as we've ministered, I've watched his life. Like I've watched Joy's life, I've watched his life. I learned so much from them. They're both uh, a little older than me, about eight years and ten years older than me. But they have so impressed my life as I've seen them up close. And I know he's going to impress your life. Now, he goes where everyone says it's closed. So he started a ministry. Now, Joy is a, a YWAMer. He's, yeah, he's part of us, but he started his ministry called Open Doors. And you're going to hear him tell a story that I've heard before, but you're going to hear this story of what he said to a leader of Taliban. You're going to hear what a leader of Hezbollah said to him that Christians ought to do. And you're going to like what he said. You're going to be shocked. But you're going to be inspired. And your faith is going to grow. Because this is also a person of faith who both of them say, Obey God. Obey God. Be a fool for God. You hear both of them saying that. And God has a message for us. And from the Netherlands, from Holland, from a little village called Heiderweich. Heiderweich. And you're going to hear this man that is known by millions, Brother Andrew. Listen. Fasten your seatbelt, but let us hear from you. We want to hear from you around the world. And put, fasten your seatbelt because he's going to take off. Brother Andrew. I'm happy that I can say welcome to you in my little private office. 
the headquarters, my little headquarters. I'm still here and still thinking of all of you. And since I mentioned Corrie Ten Boom, I remember that one day she was speaking and uh, I, I was in that meeting. I've been her chairman for 25 years. And uh, we spoke to a group of pastors in East Berlin. That was in the time when East Germany and West Germany were still two very different countries. And one of the pastors stood up and said, uh, Miss Tembom, don't you think that women should be silent in the church? Now, that is a very provocative question. And Corrie stood there for a few seconds and her face radiated the joy and she burst out and said, Hallelujah, nine. And since that time, her name in East Germany was Hallelujah, nine. Hallelujah, no. No one should be quiet in the kingdom. If in church history, as we studied, as we know it, women, uh, whether... Gladys Aylward or other, by the way, she was a great friend of mine, uh, or other, and Corey, uh, and many more names I could give you. God has used them so mightily. God despises not men or things, however weak or small, God loves to choose, and especially that what men count nothing at all. So if you feel small, insignificant, Maybe, maybe despise. Well, I want to give you hope. Uh, there's no age limit with God. There's no educational limit with God. There, uh, just do what, what he told you. And that is what gives the joy. I couldn't do much, but I did what I could. And then you may look an utter fool in the eyes of men. And, well, let's agree, first of all, we are. But... Uh, you are in the office of a man who is willing to be a fool for Christ. Well, that is sometimes a, a costly thing because it depends so much on the, the measure of your, your obedience. Uh, I remember the time when I was in the, in the WEC, that is the Worldwide Evangelization Crusade Missionary Training College in Glasgow, Scotland. And I remember... One time I was in the WEC college as a student and, and I, I, was, I was so sick. I had a terrible hernia and I know one day they even found me unconscious on the floor in the college. Uh, I, I, I couldn't go on. I was, I was a wreck. And for that very reason... I left the college without a diploma. I said I was the worst student you could possibly get. If you do the will of God, it gives an indescribable happiness. I obeyed God whether or not I understood. I don't have to understand. I obeyed God and that, that is the Christian life. So that's my uh, request, no more than that. Admonition, my strong desire for you. Obey him, even when you don't understand. What happened with all those Russian Bibles? <laughs> That's a, I, I seldom tell this. It's a lovely story. Because I happened to be at, at home, and uh, at that time in Holland... I lived in Ermelo, not far from here. Television was not often on. That was only on Wednesday afternoon, a couple of hours for the children, and otherwise just a selected, uh, selected hours. But, but then I was in my office and the children said, Daddy, the television is on. So I ran downstairs and there was... Uh, the pictures of the, the Russian army occupying uh, Czechoslovakia and 
and, and on the television, you saw people running to, to the border, trying to get out, out, out as far away as possible from those hated Russians. And when I saw that, at once I knew I have to go there. And quickly I loaded my big station wagon. I had, I had a big station wagon. And uh, with Russian Bibles, and I drove off to the Czech border, and nobody even trying to stop me there, because all the custom guards had their hands full getting people out, out, out. Everybody wanted out. Never mind the fool who wants to get in. He won't get far anyway. So. No control, no checking of papers. I just drove with my big station wagon with Russian Bibles to the church. Because in the place where you live, that is where your witness is strongest. And I came to the church and they were very anxious and they were meeting together, seeking God. What happens, Lord? Why? And, and then I came in, well, I tell you why. I bring you Russian Bibles, and you can go to the Russian soldiers and, and give them a Bible. Maybe that's why they have come to your country to get the Bible. That is certainly why I have come to your country with Russian Bibles. And so I, I put them on the table, and, and the people took them and almost ran into the street, uh, saw the tanks, the soldiers on top of the tanks, and said, here, Ivan, a Bible. And that was such a success for the church. It was a faith builder, but it was also a an, an, an revelation to the Russian army, because they never expected that they would be met with people who said, Ivan, here, a Bible, Biblia. And so they, they were totally demoralized, and within a couple of days they had to replace the entire Russian occupation army because those stupid people in Czechoslovakia gave them Bibles. And that was a wonderful story to me because it, it, it strengthened the faith of the, the Czech believers, and it, it, it again confirmed we're on the right track. When there is a threat, God's word is the solution. Not uh, more political alliances or military like the NAVO. God's word. And so, as I said, they had to replace the entire army because they were demoralized, but they went home with the word of God. And that was my purpose. That happened in 1968 when uh, I happened to be at home and we never had television at that time of the day in Holland, not then, of good old days. Uh, and they called me and I, it, everything just fell in place and it was such a wonderful experience, such a faith builder and uh, they still talk about it in Czechoslovakia. In the Bible College, every semester we had a, a break short holiday break and you had to leave the college and 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 I couldn't go anywhere because uh, I lived too far away uh, you still needed the visa for Britain at that time being Dutch so I had already made contact with Mrs. Oswald Chambers in Muswell Hill North London and so I phoned her and she said, well, come, come and stay with me. And, uh, and I did. And I, I didn't think anything of it. I mean, for me, it makes no difference whether you stay with the Hezbollah or the, or the Hamas or, 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 uh, or Mrs. Chambers. Uh, they're all people. We, you and I are only people in God's sight. So I went over there and I stayed with her. And then I came back to the college after the holidays and the, the director of studies, Stuart Dinnen, said, well, Andrew, where, where have you been 
in the holidays, I said, well, I stayed with Mrs. Chambers. You can't do that. I said, yeah, I, I know I can't do that, but sorry, I just did it. And I think here is the, where, where Christians are always the first ones to put the brakes on any God-given vision to you as an individual. You can't do that. Who says you cannot do that? When God says you can do it, you can do it. So just do that. And, and often in my life I, I have heard that word including from this director. You can't do that. And I, I just love the things, to do the things that, that people say, you can't do that. Despise not men or things, however weak or small. But God loves to choose what men count nothing at all. Just do it. You are as great in the kingdom of God as, I should say it, you are greater than an angel because you are a child of God. And angels, they fear to tread, to, to tread where, where, where men will, should step out in faith and, and, and do the things. It, it's a great life of faith. And I just love to be here in my office here at Brother Andrew's headquarters. And I'm still here every morning early for my quiet time. And, uh, and I, I want to... I want to finish well. I, I ask you prayer for me that I will finish well. Thank you. As he, I said before with, with Corey, for 25 years I was her chairman. When, when I had revival meetings in Berg in Norway, the news came that she was dying and they said, Andrew, you have to come for the funeral. And I, I terribly, I badly offended them by saying, let the dead bury the dead. Uh, Corey would not want me to leave this for her funeral. What would Jesus do? I think more important, what would Jesus say? And what he says, that is what you do. And then it is a great life to walk with God. Great life. When I first in Lebanon heard that they kept a prisoner in a darkened basement chained to the central heating not allowed to see anybody they would blindfold him when they bring in the food and uh, his name was Terry Waite that was in the 60s and that, that was my first contact when I purposely went in to see what I can do and, and I remember in West Beirut there was a Bible shop no that was in yeah, West Beirut I first bought a nice big Bible in Arabic and I took that to the headquarters of the Hezbollah and I asked if I could see the leader and they graciously let me I think they were a bit overwhelmed because those things never happened there and, uh, and, and, and I said sir I don't know what the Quran says about hostage taking but I do know what the Bible says and the Bible says you must let him go and I am here to tell you and to give you this Bible where God says let him go and his eyes grew big and he said Andrew how can you say that I said because that's what Jesus did and I spread my arms out I said, he said on the cross he gave his life for others and the normal Christian life is my willingness to give my life for somebody else and that's on the basis of what Jesus told me I give you this Bible and I also want you to let Terry Wade go 
uh, he didn't listen. So then I said, well, let me take his place. And then his eyes popped out. How can you say that? But I tell you, that, that was my first conscious contact with a terrorist organization. And that has become very intense contact, very meaningful discussions. Uh, one day when we were in discussion, uh, he said, Andrew, you Christians are not following the life of Jesus Christ anymore. I said, I didn't want to enlighten him any further. I said, what do you think we should do? He said, go back to the Bible. And a little later, he was even sadder. He said, you know, Andrew, we Muslims are not following the example in the life of the Prophet Muhammad anymore. I said, what do you think we should do? And I didn't want to say, <laughs> follow Muhammad. I said, go back to the same book that I mentioned. Go to the Bible. God tells you what to do. And then it will be a different life, a different world. And if you don't want to let him go, take me. I'll take his place. Let him go. And at, uh, one Dutchman reporter was with me. And... Uh, he, uh, he phoned my wife and, and he said, uh, did, did you know that Andrew was going to say that? He said, no, I, I, I didn't know. My wife said, uh, there are things, sorry about it, there are things you don't share with everybody because you endanger other people's lives. But I made an intense friendship with the Hezbollah there, and then and we've often met later and often discussed religious things. And I've tried to get Americans involved in a meaningful uh, debate with the Hezbollah in Lebanon, but they, they backed off. Uh, there is nothing to be afraid of when you meet terrorists, and I speak from experience, why are we so afraid? Is it because we do not fear God? Because if we would fear God, we would fear no one else, period. Are we willing to, to look stupid for Jesus? Uh, I, I see it in my own children, they, they, they go into the, the busiest uh, shopping street in Harderwijk with a chair and they put it on the street and, and they invite people to say, can I pray for you? Uh, <laughs> and they pray that the other leg will get longer or they pray for, do you have any specific needs? And then, then I think of way back when I was young, we went out onto the streets, we were proper Dutch reformed uh, young people. We used to have an open air meeting occasionally in a little square just less than 100 meters away from the church but nobody ever went there because it was always sectarian people who stood there, Salvation Army men or somehow not somebody else. And nobody ever came there. That, 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 that didn't make any impact. So then my friend Case and I, we were in the tent. And uh, the speaker was uh, related to Corrie ten Boom. He came from Paris. And uh, he spoke there that evening. And he made an invitation to come forward. And I remember two guys two young men, that was my friend Case, and myself went forward. 
to give our lives for service. And the leader of the tent, happy to see us, he said, okay, then next Saturday, we have an open air meeting in your village, and you speak, he sought me, you speak, he found me, and I speak, the evangelist said, on, he set me free. We were already sorry we went forward. But then our little comfort was that nobody ever came there to listen. So we thought, well, okay, maybe we can uh, live over that. But something went wrong. The news leaked out that two Dutch boys from the village, that whom everybody knew, were going to speak there. <laughs> and where ordinarily there were five or six people, now it seems that half the village was there. The news spread in the village that we were going to speak. That had never happened. A, a, a Dutch gereformeerde church active church member was going to speak. It seems half the village was there. All our friends. It was so embarrassing. But we spoke. And the next Sunday, it was on Saturday, in the church, lo and behold, the, the minister man managed to speak about fools who shout from the streets the message of salvation. People should go to church. Well, we were in church, but that was the beginning of the revival in my village. And it was an impressive revival. The whole village came to know it. I had a, a little squeeze box, and, and we would sing in the garden uh, behind my house, and, and, and then people would come from all around, and they would have, a, or we would go on, on Easter morning through the whole village with the group, and I would have my squeeze box again, and we would sing uh, Easter hymns, uh, the whole village knew, and that was the important part, and, and, and the whole village got involved, and that little revival went on for a long time. I have preached there a number of times in that same village, in both the churches, the, the Dutch Reformed and the Reformed Church, overcrowded. They had to carry in 200 extra chairs to to keep the crowds. And one day I was going to speak again in, in one of those churches and it was really embarrassing and I was thinking, well, maybe we should stop because uh, if, the, if the, the local pastor speaks in the evening service, there are maybe 10 or 20 people and when we speak there are 200. That's not fair, that's embarrassing. And that same evening when I had to speak in the reformed church that week the pastor committed suicide people were shattered church was still crowded and, and, and I asked the congregation I said was there no one that poor man could go to did he not have any fellowship being a pastor he was uh, in and out treated here in Veldwijk in Ermelo. There's a psychiatric institution. If your life is not solidly based on the word of God, and you have embraced his promises, you have obeyed his commandments, then Jesus said it's like building a house on sand. Uh, storm comes, rain falls, and, and it, it will go down. And my, my appeal is still the same because the gospel message does not change. And whether we are here or, or with the Taliban in, in Pakistan, and Pakistan honestly is the only country I want to go back to, I begin to doubt now whether I ever make it. And I remember speaking there for the students in the madrasa, that is the 
Quranic school of the uh, leader, the Taliban leader, and, and I preached there, and, and they stood there, all lined up, and then the Taliban leader took me by the hand, and I still see us walk back together, back to his office. He looked at me, he said, Andrew, will you soon come back and tell us more about Jesus? Now, those words still ring in my ears because it's very unlikely now that I'm almost 90 that I will, I will go back, but my heart is there because I still hear him say, Andrew, will you soon come back and tell us Muslims, in inferring that lost Muslim, will you tell us more? about Jesus. Who says Muslims don't want to know about Jesus? If we go to the Muslims and ask forgiveness, now is the time. My motto here in my office is I sincerely love all Muslims. Islam, I sincerely love all Muslims. Do I love them enough to go and ask Forgiveness, forgiveness that we have left them out of their request. I know, I know in the Quran is enough information about Jesus to get saved. But I think very few ever travel that road. They're open. I think every Muslim in the world is open, especially now in this time of extremism and terrorism. Uh, actually, this is a great time alive. I'm I'm happy I'm alive. alive though. A while ago, some Christians were killed in that area, in the Taliban area. I was very mad at, at, at the Taliban leader. I I phoned him. I said, how, "How can you do that?" He said, "Andrew, there are 29 Taliban groups in this country. Which one do we refer to?" It was not us. We condemn it as much as you do. And they had a, a, a memory, ser memory service, memorial service for the people that are uh, killed. I think there were at least 1,000 people at the memorial service. We, we must change our thinking. We must ask forgiveness and don't expect them to come to us for forgiveness. There's nothing we have to forgive. We have to confess our sins because we have not given them a chance to get in touch with the living Jesus. We have kept our big mouth shut. We have... <laughs> Let's be very open. The Muslims in, in Holland experience the, the, the hatred that we Dutch have toward Muslims extremists, the ISIS, uh, I know if the only source of information you have about Islam in Holland is television. All you see is cruelty and, and uh, terrible things that happen both in Syria and the Middle East, but, but also in, in our own country. We have to go there I know terrible things happen, but that, that's all over the world. Uh, we, nothing will dissolve us of our uh, commission to reach all nations. And again, when you watch the Dutch television, it's very sobering to, to see all the, the, the measures we take to, to shut them in and to isolate them. I, I have no, I'm not a politician. I wish I, I could do something. We have contact with politicians, of course, in open doors that I don't want to go into details now. But please pray for us. We want to make a difference. And you and I, as Christians together, we can make the difference.
I had a lot of contact, but I was not not very fond of Arafat's character because he was a, he was a, a compromiser. Uh, I know from insiders who would ask Arafat, "How come you always survive those assassination attempts against you?" And then, if if he knew you were a Christian, he would pull out a little cross. This one said. But if you were a Muslim, you would pull out a little ankh, little Muslim symbol. That's politicians' talk. I don't like that. <laughs> be open, and I think we should be open. And if we are open, then they they respect you. We we hide behind our fear, talk with them, witness, give scriptures, and it's, it's still wonderfully possible. Uh, the Hamas leader himself in Gaza, uh, his, his son was my private chauffeur. Uh, then in one of the Israeli attacks on his home. They killed his son. The, the, the response, our response, I don't think it should be pro or anti-Israel. It's pro-people. God loves Palestinians and Israelis as much as any one of us. Let's get that message across in words and in deeds. And then we'll be surprised to see what we can do. Let's just get, let fear not is what Jesus said. Fear not. And then you find out to your own surprise, gee, there is nothing to fear. You have to go, of course, to, to England for eccentric people. Sorry, British folks, I love you. But uh, there was a, one of those famous sandwich men walking through London with a big sign on his front, I am a fool for Christ. And people saw him pass and they turned their heads and they read at the back, and whose fool are you? That's a deep question, really. It's, it's not just a funny statement. We are foolish if we think that Jesus has no solution for the problems that we face today, both with Islam as with Donald Trump or with politics or with capitalism. Uh, the gospel is so simple, really. Don't make it more complicated than what you think it is. And the main message is, it's still John 3.16 in the capsule, capsule. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not, should not, should not perish but have everlasting life. And John 3.16 is not the only verse in the Bible. The Bible is so full of it, it already starts in the Old Testament and goes on through the entire New Testament, but it captures down to that one verse. And, uh, and then you come to Romans 10, that whoever puts his trust in him shall be saved. The message is simple. Why do we make it so complicated? Why? You answer that. And in answering that for yourself, you find release, you find forgiveness, you find eternal life, you find your life's destiny, 
and you find out that the Bible is true after all. Hallelujah. If I could do all this, I would be far more radical. Too often, I have made the easy decision, we must never be afraid to be witnesses for Jesus. It's the prayer that my wife and I have almost every night together for our own children, our grandchildren. I, I know they do a number of things that we used to do. Uh, but now even in my own hometown, you, you're not allowed to have open air, open air meetings anymore. Uh, do we realize how restricted we are with a, a Christian evangelical burgemeister? <laughs> uh, if we do not, do not use our liberty, whom are we going to blame when one day those liberties are taken away from us? Answer me. Do we work for results or do we work because we want to obey the Great Commission? And when I look back over the field and we have, I don't want to brag about numbers, because, but we have more than a thousand people working in that area. We do see results. We do see people come to Christ. We see God's protection and the miracles. I'm really not a bit discouraged. To the contrary, I see how God is blessing our work. And, and, and if you pray, there will be more blessing. Uh, there is an old little saying when they when they uh, when they paid the place was shaken when they paid the place was taken uh, the answer is in when they prayed and then our message, the impact of our message will shake the world. And we uh, put so much emphasis on, on possessions, churches, all those big buildings. Uh, well, they're more or less for sale now, at least in my hometown. Uh, but in other places too. Uh, emphasis should be on prayer, believing prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here we stand. Together we stand. There we unite, not for the sake of unity, but for the sake of the body of Christ. That is the only motivation. Do it, friend, in Jesus' name. Do you wonder about the foundations of YWAM? These two, along with some others God has given us, they laid a foundation of teaching that you are moving on. And as we understand that, it's a part of our DNA with Joy Dawson and Brother Andrew. Not only have they been heard by millions, but they came to YWAM when we were nobodies. We're still nobodies, just happen to be more nobodies. <laughs> but as we've gone out, I remember when Brother Andrew came to Lausanne the first time, 1970, and uh, immediately everybody wanted to take Bibles into the Iron Curtain countries. Now, I'd gone first. I always tried to go ahead of time, but I'd gone in 1961 to Moscow to Czechoslovakia, to Poland, to other nations, all, all alone. But uh, 
after Brother Andrew came, we had lots of people go, and they're still going because this man laid down his life and continues to do so with his voice even at this hour as he's sharing with us. And I want to end with this time of saying how amazing things are in the world today. But first, let me tell you, we've heard now from Nova Scotia, Canada, Curitiba, Brazil, Uganda, Mozambique, Madagascar, Townsville in Australia, Krasnodar, that's Siberia in Russia. We also have heard from Bulgaria, New Zealand, Argentina, Singapore, Maharashtra, India, and our new boat, uh, vessel now, our ship in, out of Croatia, a DTS on board the ship has been watching as well and being a part of this. By land, by sea, and all over the world, we're, we're meeting together, and this is something that God is birthing now for your future. This is something that we need to recognize what God has given to us as a new highway. But let me talk about here in, in this closing time how important it is to understand that this is the hour that is the greatest hour in the history of the Great Commission that the world has ever known. Now, in the next few days, starting not, not just six days or seven days from now, I'm going to be meeting with leaders of the body of Christ. Our first stop, we're going to go to 10, 10 states and all in 10 days. But our first stop, we're meeting with 20 leaders that are known to be the leaders of the most advanced missions in the world today. And then we go to another group and then another group and then another group. And we are a part of something that is far beyond YWAM. And this is the body of Christ that's on the move. Now, here's our goal. It's very simple. Say zero. zero. Say zero around, zero around the world. Yes, we want to say zero to those that have never heard the gospel. We want to say zero to those that have never had access to the Bible in their mother tongue. Right now, there's 1,721 languages that have not one verse of Scripture. What do we want to do about it? Let's go to zero. Are you ready for zero? God is. That's what he told us to do 2,000 years ago. He said, go to every creature. That means there's zero that haven't heard. And that's the word of God. Now, something is happening in the world. And as you know from my first book, as uh, it's gone out now 125 languages or more, and uh, it talks about when I had that first vision, I was 20 years old, almost 21, and it was seeing the waves of young people by the millions going from everywhere to everywhere. And as I would say again, I wanted to say to Jesus, if you're going to do that, I want to be a part. And we're all a part right now, wherever you are in the world, we're a part of that, that move of God, the waves going across the continents. So we've heard at this occasion already from every continent in the world as they are online with us. And please, please go to, go to Facebook chat and, and tell others to get in on, online as well because this will be repeated for the next several days. And as you do, let's also pray that God will move by his spirit. But God does speak to me uh, out of that time of the waves. But I want to show you a wave that's happening now. This wave is so powerful that it's building and it's growing. And the older ones, as we've been hearing tonight, 
and, and today for many of you around the world. As you've been hearing at this event, they, they are like the jet ski riders that pull up the younger ones to the top of the wave. The words you have heard has been pulling you up in faith, pulling you up in your character, pulling you up in the ways of God, understanding the ways, uh, pulling you up to understand the character of God that we must model our lives after. And as we do so, we're going to be able to ride the biggest wave in all of the history of mankind to this point. And we will see a spiritual awakening. Now, this is a big wave. I used to ride waves as a kid. But this is a big wave. And this is not the right wave. But it's a wave. And as we see the wave that is taking place with the jet ski, I hope, we're going to see something that the world has never seen. This is a wave that took place out of Portugal over, they say, 100 feet high. And as you see these great waves, there's a wave coming that is now building a spiritual wave, and it's going to literally be the one that will sweep the earth as the waters cover the sea. And as we ride that wave, there, there's going to be something here for every one of you, especially the digital, the millennial generation. You're going to see, staying on your own surfboard, that's your gift and calling that is without repentance. Think of eternity. If it's without repentance, God's going to use it in eternity as well. And as the wave comes, the glory of the Lord, that white foam, will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk 2.14. And we're going to see the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Are you ready for that? Do you want to see it around the world? Be a part of it now. Because we have to prepare the way of the Lord, like John the Baptist. We have to get out in front of the wave. We're out in front of the, uh, the, the, the foam, the white foam, that, that is the metaphor for the glory of the Lord and the knowledge of it covering the earth as the waters cover the sea. And how do we get out in front of it? We do it with the gospel. We do it... In other ways, I'll come back to Bible, but we do it in, in order to bring people together in fellowships around the Word of God. We do it in setting up schools for Christian uh, education for the young. This is, we're being literally railroaded into an antichrist movement called secularism, and we don't realize how, it, how gradual it's been over the last uh, about four, four generations now. And it's been so gradual that people didn't seem to notice. But we are being taught in relativity of truth. There is no absolutes. Therefore, there is no God. And as a result, we are seeing young people growing up who really have no idea of the difference of right and wrong. And we see that and in Isaiah, it prophesies a time like this when right will be wrong and wrong will become right. And it's all upside down and that's where it's going but there's still I tell you good news because the word of God when it goes out it'll go through our acts of mercy giving food to the hungry water to the thirsty clothing to the naked and a house uh, a shelter for those that are homeless and health care for those that are sick and visiting the prisoner that's what Jesus said in Matthew 25 verse 35 and 36 that's a part of the great commission too but to disciple all nations you gotta have the word of God and as we think of that time we're in right now 500 years, and I'm meeting with 80 global leaders in Wittenberg, Germany this June, 11 through, I think it's 11 through 15, and as we meet together, we're saying, okay, let's finish the task. And as we finish the task, these are from all kinds of nations uh, that these leaders are coming together uh, by invitation only. And as we meet together, we are convinced that we are in a day that there's a generation right behind our age. And that's your generation. And you're going to be a part of this. You're going to see it happen. And that wave is going to reach to all of those, the least, the last, the lost around the world. Those that have never 
heard, those that have never seen, just in the area of reaching the unreached people group, we can say this because we know we've been involved in these meetings and we've been involved in seeing the, the examples and the results. There are results that come. That's the fruit. And we don't live for the results. We live for obedience, as we heard Brother Andrew say. But in obedience, there will be fruit. And we have seen this in the year of 2007. They asked us in leadership uh, in YWAM if we would lead and choosing Mark, Mark Anderson to leave it lead out for a movement around the world with, with the largest missions. And now there are 1,200 missionary groups denominations and organ Christian organizations working together to see the fulfillment of the Great Commission. We call it Call to All. Because in 2007, there were 639 unreached, unengaged, not one Christian, not one church, not one pastor, not one missionary. That was in 2007, 10 years ago. What has happened now? That number, that was for those over 100,000 population, unreached people groups. And over 100,000 population, some into the millions, not one believer. Today, that number has decreased down towards zero. We are now at five groups left in that category that have no believers, no church, no pastor, no missionary. Over 4,000 missionaries have gone to those groups. And as a result, we have now into the seven-figure amount of believers that have been baptized and are now meeting together in churches by the thousands in the last 10 years. The wave is growing. Don't miss it. Don't, be a, don't miss the greatest thing in history the world has ever known. It's a spiritual awakening that is rising. So we had to go from 100,000 down to 50,000, down to 25,000, down to 5,000 uh, in these unreached people groups. Now we're at 5,000 uh, uh, of, of the unreached people groups, only 5,000 people in each one of those. We want to go back down to the area of zero. Every unreached person, every unreached people group, and we want to go right to the end called zero. And that's with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, we have to have the Bible. And we're, we're, we've committed ourselves in YWAM around the world that we're going to see a Bible, at least a portion of it. We're trying for the, of course, the, the first of all, the book of Luke. And that will be in the Jesus film. And there's 1,400 languages that have the Jesus film. But there's 5,600 languages that don't. And our first team that went out two years ago, they literally saw the Jesus film go into eight languages in only four weeks. And that was right, right here from Kona. As we sent them out to Papua New Guinea, eight languages that, that went into the lives of let's say a half a million people, 500,000 people within those four weeks. Following that, we 500,000 people saw the Jesus film in their mother tongue. Isn't that amazing what happened? Now it's happening more. It's happening in the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, and uh, Papua New Guinea, and other places that we're going into. Up in the Himalayas, we're going across to 7 million homes with the Word of God. And that's going on right now. It's happening in Central America, in, in Norway, in Brazil, in, in, in uh, Colombia, in other nations, could, in also Costa Rica in the Central America. We are seeing it start to happen and a growing movement of getting the Word of God out. And as we get it out, we're going to see something that happened 500 years ago. When the Word of God came into 20 languages, translated for the first time into 20 languages, that gave birth at that time, we call it the Reformation, but it gave birth to Western civilization. And when just 20 lang languages got a Bible, they needed the printing press. 
And because of Gutenberg, they were able to get the Bible out to the common people. It changed the world. It gave birth to Western civilization. And as a result, the classical music, classical arts was born from the Word of God. If you look at Bach, he signs every, every page to the glory of God. Or you look at Rembrandt, he's holding the foot of the cross, knowing that he too, by his sin, had crucified Jesus. You will see that the, the leading uh, scientists, fathers of modern science, Galileo, Copernicus, and others, and Francis Bacon, he's, he's really said as the number one father of modern science. So as you see all this happening, then the Industrial Revolution over in England, as all of that came as a result of the Word of God getting to the people in their mother tongue. And soon we had numbers that were up to 50 languages in their mother tongue, in that part of the world especially. And so as we see now, for the glory of God to get to every area of the world, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then the word of God to bring in the discipleship of all nations. That's what Jesus said. He didn't say some nations. He said all nations. And so we need to see that happen. Therefore, the word of God needs to get out there. And that's what we're very much involved in, and we have seen a dearth of, but now it's a growing movement, and it's a part of that great, great big wave. And we now have the modern day, the, the wonderful tool that Gutenberg gave us of multiplying the message, and as my friend David Hamilton calls it, the Googleberg Press. It's Google now. As uh, Andy Bird's son came to him when he was a lot smaller, he said, Daddy, when is Jesus coming back? And Andy said, well, no one knows. He says, well, let's Google it then. <laughs> and so this is something that is so common that kindergartners understand the, the, uh, the Internet. And we need to understand what God has given to us and then spread the gospel through cyberspace. And then as we do this, God's faithfully moving us toward uh, not just... Uh, cyberspace, which is internet, but terrestrial, which is the towers and so on, but celestial, which is the satellites. And you go to Revelation, let's see, I think it's chapter 14, verse 6, and it talks about this, this uh, angel or this messenger, the Greek is, the messenger flying throughout mid-heaven with the gospel for every human being on earth. And it's going to go to every tribe, every language, and every nation. And that's in the Word of God from 2,000 years ago. And now they're testing it, and it's proving right. They can literally go from the satellite to your device in your pocket or your purse of every person on the earth with language recognition so that they, they can all get the Jesus film, the Bible, and teaching into their mother tongue. And that's happening in just these next few years. And then when they get the written, we're going to do oral translations first because they, they don't know how to read yet. But we now have a, a wonderful gift from God in Uniscript that's going to help them learn to read very fast. We're, we're, we've tested it out now in 50 languages. But in addition to that, the written word of God, uh, the Bible's going into that, and that always brings uh, literacy throughout the world. So you have the very, the very tools that are miraculously given by God to us and to the body of Christ at large. We are now in a time when we can see the world covered with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Don't miss the wave. This is a part of time of history. And we've seen the history part that is challenging us to do the impossible. And the impossible, the impossible is made possible by the presence of power and the understanding, the revelation of who God is. And as Joy Dawson started with us uh, when she joined YWAM back in the late 60s or first of 70, uh, as she began to say, you've got to know God. 
You've got to know God. You can't make him known if you don't know him. You don't know him in order to make him known. You know him because it's right. And then you will, out of the overflow, make him known. That's the way it works. And God wants us to allow him to invade us through that door. You have the door knob on the inside. Open that door and say, come and be a part of every day, every hour of my life. And as we do, then he will say, here's my heart. My heart is for those that are isolated in the islands. And here we get a message from one of our 25 ships around the world that they're going to the isolated and they're listening right now to us and they're being a part of this, this gathering. And we trust that in the future we'll have from one of the ships literally having one of these gatherings from around the world. This is not just for Lauren and Joy and, and, and uh, Brother Andrew. This is for all of you to realize that what is what God has put in your hand. Now use it for the glory of God. Multiply it for the glory of God. We'll try to encourage more by having more of these events. But in the meantime, tell others to get on line with us in ywam. Uh, dot live, not alive, but live, ywam dot live. And as we do so, we're going to glorify God and stand with those in heaven that are glorifying God, looking over the balconies of heaven and saying, look what's happening. There's Paul up there. There's Peter up there. There's all of these early disciples saying, oh, now we see what we started back then. It looks so small. Look at what's happening as more than a billion have come to Christ. We're not talking millions anymore. We're going to the big B and we're going to see billions come to Jesus. And as we do so, Jesus is going to be Lord and the knowledge of him will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. I want us to all stand and we're going to worship God together one last time here, led by Aaron Barker and his team. And this is an anointed team, an anointed man of God. And God has, has all already said he's going to be used of God right throughout the world over the internet and this is already happening and we want to see something very special take place even in our lives tonight and I'll, I'll just close in prayer not close in prayer but pray for you wherever you are Lord I pray for those that are out there in all of these six continents that are right now tuned in with us and a part of this gathering and here from Kona or from Los Angeles or from Netherlands. But we pray, God, for all of them that we will not only be united in spirit as we have been and united in word, but that we will be united in the challenge of God as Jesus gave it to us to go into all the world. That's geography. Preach, that's communication. The gospel, that's the good news never changes. Every creature your demographics but go and disciple all nations how by baptizing them how do you baptize them with the teaching of the word of God and we see them soaking in it as they then teach to the people to obey all that he commanded us and then he promises I'll be with you always I pray that now I pray that now for everyone that's a part of this time and those that will become a part as over the next days this begins to go viral out across the nations and give it, as they give it to their pastors. It goes into churches. It goes into homes. It goes into offices. It goes into other places. Let the people be challenged that we are on the winning side because Jesus doesn't lose. He always is going to win because he is and was and is to come the Almighty. And we are seeing it happen in our day for your glory we do it we obey you with joy and with endurance and with faith because you are the one that can be depended on in jesus name amen take us into praise and worship aaron let's close with this song where we tried to bring all of these themes together and this song we started with and we'll worship the Lord as the king of the nations. And so, Father, we ask that you would take us deeper, we would walk in obedience, and we would see the knowledge of the glory of the Lord cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Let's sing this together. I open up to you. The 
Shout your praise, hearts will cry, these bones 
tell you about this too. Listen, we've got, uh, we're hearing from Gabon, West Africa, Macedonia, Senegal, East Surabaya, Denpasar, Bali, Indonesia, and uh, from Hong Kong, South Korea, Philippines, Spain, Worcester, South Africa, Herlock, Germany, Turkey, Hanoi, Vietnam, and as, as the sun goes around, see, they're waking up. <laughs> so keep telling others about it, and we'll just keep heading around the world. It's th tens of thousands now that have been uh, connecting with us, and so we just thank the Lord for this night. May it just continue to multiply and grow. God bless you, and thank you so much. Are we dismissed? Are you finished, or did you have another? All right. God bless you. 
Have a good, bon weekend. Good weekend.